You heard the thing. I did. Okay. I took the gray card over in front of him as a secretary. Are you going to agree? I'm going to. So it's not the other way. I'm going to turn off sound and turn it back on for a second. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that I. In other words, it's rolling right now and recording sound. And it's doing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, I, I heard the tone. Okay. Good. All right. This is recording. And you see the recording. Uh, Okay, now we're going to start. All right, so now you clap with Terry. Let me just focus on Charlie with this camera. Okay. <coughs> I'm Gary Eagle. Yes. Okay. Charlie Plum interview, take one. All right, great. Um, <laughs> you probably know how to fly a test. Uh, most of it. Let me give you a clue for reference. I'm just going to warm you up a little bit to your speaking voice by kidding. I have... And we're not going to do Dunga Ding. We can. <laughs> oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth, danced the skies on laughter's silvered wings. Sunward I have climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you've not dreamed of. Wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting winds along and flung my eager craft through the footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the wind's breadth heights in easy grace, where never a lark or even eagle flew, and while the, with silent, lifting mind I've trod, the high, untrespassed sanctity of space put out my hand and touched the face of God. How's that? It matters not. Oh, yeah. You want to do Invictus? I think I know that one. Okay. <clears throat> okay, Charlie, I'm not here. The only yep. person in the room is him. Dark is the night that covers me, black as a pit from pole to pole. I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. Through the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeoning of chance, my head is bloody, but unbowed. Hmm. I'm, I'm losing. What, what's the first line of that? It matters, not, it matters not, not how straight the gate, how filled with punishments the soul. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. How's that? <clears throat> Do we want to turn to Charlie's chair a little bit more toward me? Is that okay? Um, hang on a second. I'm, right I'm not quite facing you, yeah, but I'm... I'm a, take your chair to where you can face directly towards that door and feel comfortable with it. such a pleasure to see you again. <laughs> Thank you. And I feel like this journey started with you way back. I can remember Bill Natter first saying, you know, we've got some guys in our class that are former POWs, you should meet them all. And he gave me your contact information and we started and that led to freedom and friendship and choice and, you know, sailing around on your little boat on a little Western <laughs> village and now it's being, you know, knowing Stan and being part of Personal level, professional level, it's quite a thing. Um, I'm going to fix my shoes up, so keep going. Great idea. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead. There's a, I've got in your interview the sheet down, and I'm saying this as much for my editor right now, that in the integrity of files, we have you interviewed being hit by the San Mar missile, coming down with the whole thing. Um, so I... You in particular are, you s 
spent a lifetime telling this story, so you've refined so many ways of thinking about it and perspective on it and living in this that I want to try to really maximize that. So um, I'm kind of going to kind of break it up into sections. All right. And kind of, and, and if we can, keep in mind that you and I are finding our way to talk to the military audience about the values, lessons, and soul-wrenching possibilities in this. Uh, as we talked about at dinner last night, I think the key is a big component of, of what, of the transformation. So let's start with the key, whether it's from the standpoint of the national viewpoint where Vietnam was, we had all kinds of assumptions about Vietnam and the way it filtered down to you pilots. I think there was a certain amount of bravado in our you know, sorays into North Vietnam and our bombing raids and everything else. And then suddenly, and I'll never forget you describing going down the parachute and you're hearing this pop, pop, pop. And you realize they're shooting at you and you're appalled. Don't they know that you're an American pilot? Like that's, <laughs> you can't imagine that a, a grunt in the army <coughs> being shot at in the jungle would feel that. It's like war's on, game's on. This was a, so let's start with the key. The, and, the, and I'll let you freeform a little bit about that. You know, what, <coughs> somehow finding our way to the resolution of that, to the hope, to the, um, and eventually to the disarmament. So let's start with the key. The, the, I guess the first time I felt defeat was in the parachute because I had never really imagined myself ever jumping out of that airplane. You know, that was my home. I was in the womb in that airplane, you know, nice air conditioning, uh, you know. And I, and I, I control the world, you know, I've, I've, at my fingertips, I can destroy a lot of stuff and I can go twice the speed of sound. And so the transition, the 90 second transition, I think from king of the skies to scum of the earth um, was the transition into a defeatist mentality. And then it got worse in the torture where I wasn't as strong as I thought I was going to be. You know, I felt that I was going to stick with name, rank, serial number, date of birth, the code of conduct. And I flew the skies of North Vietnam thinking I was strong enough to stick with the code. And I wasn't strong enough. Uh, and then put into a, a little eight foot by eight foot prison cell and, and given nothing more than two bowls of rice a day in a two-gallon bucket <clears throat> for my toilet, uh, I, I felt very defeated. And um, that brings on, uh, brings on several emotions. Uh, this defeatist attitude um, brings on a lot of, 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 of mental pain. And it, <clears throat> and it manifests itself, I think, as um, guilt, you know, that I didn't live up to the standard. What am I going to say to my family? What am I going to say to the other pilots that didn't get shot down and were stronger and, and older and more mature and better pilots than I was? And, uh, and so that guilt sort of wrenched as, uh, as, as an, after, an after effect of the defeat, or maybe it was part of it. Um, and depression, you know, I felt very depressed. And so... And, and of course, I was all alone with, with no communication, nothing to do, no window to look out, no TV to watch, no, <clears throat> no Blackberry Bluetooth. I didn't, you know, I didn't have, I didn't have anything outside my, my mind in, in, in that little um, crucible of, uh, of guilt and, um, uh, and failure. And, uh, and that's when I... I uh, found Bob Shoemaker. <clears throat> Bob was in a, a cell on the other side of a storeroom from me, and he passed a wire 
through that uh, across the the um, boxes and around the shovels and through the ropes and into the little hole in my cell wall. That wire was a little over 14 feet long, and he'd figured out a way to get that out the hole in his cell wall and into the hole in my cell wall. Passed me a note with the tap coat on the note. This uh, this this five by five matrix of the alphabet, where you could where you could. Um, designate any letter by two numbers, number of the line, number of the row. And I learned the tap code and started to communicate with the shoemaker. And um, what I found <laughs> was that defeat was not an option, that, um, that I'd better get out of my misery and pain if I'm ever going to be effective again. And uh, and that I had a support group of a bunch of guys that originally felt as defeated as I did. And so there was a community there. And, and maybe, not, you know, maybe not what you'd suspect. We didn't feel our, that we were a community of losers. Uh, that, 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 was not, you know, that, that was not our game. The leadership had turned the whole thing around. Jim Stockdale, Jeremiah Denton, um, so several of the other senior leaders had decided that we were still warriors. We still had an obligation. We were not on, we were not on the defensive. And when I first heard that, you know, I'm a very junior officer, okay? And I'm thinking, this is not, <laughs> I looked around the prison cell, you know? I looked at my body. I'm, I've got four open wounds, no medical care, okay? I, I, I'm, I'm uh, losing weight fast. Um, and... Uh, and, and, and I'm thinking I'm not on the defensive here. I'm, I'm still fighting this. But it worked. It worked. It, that brought us out of the, the, uh, the failure mode and into the warrior mode. And the resilience sort of happened because of the change in attitude. Now, uh, I, I knew a couple of things just from, from history. I knew that about a third of the POWs in Korea had died, not from disease, not f they weren't killed, they weren't uh, executed. They died because they lost the will to live, that they, that they, they, they wallowed in, in this crucible of defeat and crawled over in the corner and assumed the fetal position, and they died, a third. And I... I made up my mind at that time that um, I think I'm going to live through this. But if I die in here, I'm not going to kill myself. This is not going to be suicidal. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, I am not going to let this defeatist attitude be the demise of Charlie Plum. If I die here, they got to work on it. You know, the, the enemy has to put, put forward some, some effort, okay, to destroy me. So, and, and you know, there, there are a lot of little things that, that came up. One of, the, one of the, um, the little quotes that Shoemaker passed to me, I think it was Bob, but somewhere along the way, you know, we passed along patriotic quotes and poetry and Bible verses and these kinds of things. The, uh, the quote that really made sense to me was this. One second, sorry. Okay. Let this pass by because I want to go to Genesis. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, several, several quotes came to mind, uh, and some that I got from the other guys, and one of the most meaningful ones that came across that, that made a lot of sense to me was this. Acid does more harm in the vessel it's stored than on the subject it's poured. What that meant to me was my bitterness, my vitriol within me is... Is, is doing more harm to me than it's doing to the enemy. In fact, they probably like it. You know, they, they kind of like to see me waller in my defeat. 
And so the acid that I have within me is going to is going to hurt me more than than whatever I try to spew that acid upon. I went back to the midshipman prayer that I had learned at the Naval Academy. It's a long prayer. It starts out, uh, Almighty and most merciful Father, whose ways are in the seas, whose paths are in the great waters, whose command is over all, let me feel your presence and be obedient to your will. It goes on and on. And then it says, if I am inclined to doubt, steady my faith. If I should miss the mark, give me the courage to try again. So, you know, that gave, kind of gave me the inspiration to, uh, uh, to, to fight through this defeatist attitude. Give me the courage to try again. Um, and, 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 you know, and there are several other uh, things that came along that sort of validated this whole principle that, hey, uh, yeah, we're in a tough situation. You know, we're not going to deny that. We can't positively think our way out of this prison camp. But we also uh, still control our own destiny. And that was a big one, too, you know, is uh, we, we, can, we can waller in this negativism, um, this defeatist attitude, we can point our fingers to lots of other people, blame the president for sending me over here and starting this war, blame the enemy for torturing prisoners, blame the mechanic that put my airplane together. You can blame, 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 blame. And uh, what it does is it sort, of den it sort of gives the control over to whoever you're blaming. If you're gonna maintain control, if you're going to really control your own destiny, and, and, and another, an, another thing that, that came about in that prison situation, I can't remember if I made it up or somebody else did, but it's this. Adversity is a horrible thing to waste. And the whole point is, when you're going through a challenge in life, you, um, you, you have to first of all believe that there's value in the challenge. It's a horrible thing to waste. Well, how do you waste adversity? You know, how, how do you take the negative stuff in your life and, um, and waste them? You do it by uh, showering yourself with pity, um, blaming other people for your problems, um, feeling sorry for yourself, denying that you have any control of your destiny. How do you take advantage of adversity? Uh, well, first of all, you recognize there's value in every situation in life. My mother told me, her words came back to me many times during this, my mother was a wonderful, wonderful lady, just the mother, Mother Teresa, you know, she, I never, in all the years that I knew my mother, I, My mother was the Mother Teresa. She was a wonderful person, and of all the years that I knew my mother, I never heard I never heard her say a bad word about anybody. I, I, can you imagine that? Somebody that just never complains about anybody else. And she, of course, she was a very religious lady, and she was very forgiving. And I, you know, and I picked this up uh, that it's certainly a Christian principle to forgive, uh, and I think that's one of the things that delineates Christianity is that we forgive. It's okay. Are you doing dab on? Oh, you know, that's a, he's towing a tar, he's towing a, a, a glider. We're going to have a lot of that today. When, when you hear, when you hear that engine um, under strain, he's towing a glider. And uh, Sundays are big days for glider towing. And particularly if there's much lift over the mountains. Yeah. Ready? So what were we talking about? My mother, my, my mother um, was a, a very religious person and, and taught me forgiveness. But I thought it was a religious principle. You know, a, a good principle. I believe it. And I believe in it. 
but I found that it's more than just a good idea. It is a survival technique, right? That when you forgive other people for the perceived harm that they have done you, you're actually uh, forgiving yourself. And, and you grow through this forgiveness. <clears throat> well, she also, my mom would say, you know, son, in every situation in life, uh, there's good news, there's bad news. And the secret to life is to solve the puzzle of the good from the bad and choose the good. And that went through my mind a lot, you know, uh, during the, the prison situation. And even after I came home and found that my wife of my high school sweetheart had filed for divorce and, and laying in that hospital bed in Chicago. I'm thinking, Mom, this can't be right. You know, <laughs> there's, there's no good news here. <laughs> you know, but she was right, you know, uh, th that, that there is. Uh, there's the choices that you make. And so I think that was one of the indelible things that happened to me in the first few months of that prison situation was to decide uh, that I'm not a victim, that uh, I haven't been defeated, that I still have control, of, uh, I don't control the things around me, that's for sure, but I control my response to the things around me. And I can look for that thing that my mom taught me about, that how can any of this be good? Well, she says there's good and bad in every situation. Uh, there's a Bible verse that came to mind as well, Romans 8, 28, and that is, um, all things work together for good to those that love the Lord. And I challenged that. And I said, do I have that right? Um, it, it, that can't be, you know, all things work together for good. All I have to do is love the Lord. I'm gonna see if that works. And, and I mean, it, all of these principles, you know, um, are easy to say, and, but they don't work like that. <laughs> it, it, it takes time and it takes pain to really figure out that, um, that, there is, that these principles work, that there is value in the pain and, uh, and that it can be, can be used for good. So let's stay for a moment on the defeat only because I can imagine a young returning warrior from Afghanistan has got two of his legs blown off and he's lying in bed and he doesn't want. He hears about what he sees as the heroes of Vietnam who endured and you know came through and returned with honor and to this day and he sees this footage and you know, you guys, he doesn't see himself in this. He wants to end his life. He wants to give up. He doesn't see any hope. You know, I have a, a, a nephew who was burned over 60% of his body and he's gonna be scarred for life horribly. And I can imagine what goes through him as, you know, this young, handsome kid and just, my life has been horribly changed. And what, part of what we've discovered in this project is that some of the icons of inventiveness and courage and bravery, like Bob Schumacher, tried to take his life. Al Carpenter wanted to take his life. Phil Butler wanted to take his life. In fact, there's very few who I've talked to who haven't at one point or another said, I want it, so thank you, Al. Take me out of this. For those that don't yet know this path, and you're laying out beautiful precepts for that path of forgiveness, uh, you know, and, uh, everything you're saying is spot on, absolutely beautiful, and we'll be able to use it, but I just want to get back to that moment that that you felt so honestly when you were first floating down, and that, like it says, um, Ev told me when he hit the ground, it was the first time he smelled you and I, mm -hmm. and there was something <coughs> Mm -hmm. not what we were doing on the ship and all that was a kind of artificial reality. We floated our world around. You know, we, we transported our home, you know, <laughs> you know yeah. our American soil with us, but this is not American soil. And that moment when Bob got through you, when you first saw this wire coming through, 
And the moment when Stockdale said, we are not the Cougars, we're not on the defensive, and it meant so much to you. If you could help me deconstruct both of those <coughs> don't feel they're heroes. Um, talk to me a little bit about the painful process of realizing you're not what you thought you were. So that these guys can go, I see myself in this. Sure. Um, it's not easy at all to to tell this tell our POW message of resilience to someone who's going through the challenges like the ones that we faced. And if anybody had had, had laid out these tenets to me, okay, when I was hanging in the parachute or when I, while I was being tortured, especially while I was being tortured, if anybody had ever told me, hey, buck up, buddy, you know. You're going to be better because you went through this. I would have strangled them. You know, it, it would have been so asinine, so unbelievable, so out of focus for anything that I was feeling at the time. And I can understand that when I tell people my story, that that's 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 the first emotion. Now, and especially, you know. A lot of people would say, oh, well, sure, he was a fighter pilot, you know, and, 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 and he was the, the top of his game, and, and uh, you know, he had, had, had been trained for all of this, and, and I haven't been trained like he was trained, or, or maybe he was older than I was, or, you know, or he, had a, uh, he had a commission, you know, in the military, and I'm just a grunt. And, uh, and, and so I, I get that pushback, you know, and I can understand that. Um, I've, I've done some work in prisons, and because people thought that have, me having been in prison, I could speak to prisoners. I've done, I've done some work in prisons uh, because, uh, well, the leadership thought that I could identify and could turn some of these, these uh, recalcitrant uh, prisoners into productive citizens, okay? I mean, you know, it seemed kind of normal. And it was a total failure. The prisoners did not see me as one of them. They, they didn't, you know, they thought that I was that I was on a higher hierarchy, you know, that I was a rich guy, you know, or I showed up in my coat and tie, you know, and they're in their prison garb. And, um, and, and, and it, was, it never worked. Uh, we tried and tried, and it just never seemed to work. I could not get through to these guys because they could not identify with who I was and what I did. Well, um, yeah, I'm a com commissioned officer when I was shot down, and yeah, I was 24 years old when I was shot down, and, and I had an education, and I had wonderful parents. <clears throat> um, but oh, by the way, you know, I, I, was, <laughs> I was certainly not without a few chinks in my armor, you know. Uh, I, I, I had a background that was pretty tough, and, uh, and, I, I, and I was going through some things that were pretty tough. But going through the process, um, took time and pain, and and I, I have a little philosophy of life is that I think to change your mind on anything it takes pain over a period of time, because you can have instant pain and and get well and get through it, uh, or you can have very little pain over a long period of time and that doesn't seem to help, but pain over time it seems the thing that really changes your attitude towards things. So, so to, um, you know, to, to talk to folks that, that don't see the connection between their life and mine. I mean, I, I, you know, I have hands and feet. I am a full-bodied, well, nearly full-bodied person, uh, and, and, and I came through that. And so somebody that's missing an arm and a leg, uh, or somebody that's just lost a child, that's one of the things that, you know, people, people say to me, boy, I could never have gone through that prison experience. And, uh, and I said, there are two or three things that I don't think I could ever go through, and one of them is the loss of a child. Or our ladies will come up to me and they say, well, that's, that's, 
I could never have gone through the pain. I said, do you have any children? <laughs> and they, oh yeah, I've got three kids. Well, I've watched my wife go through childbirth, and I gotta tell you, I can't do that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> this, is not, this is not possible. Uh, I cannot, I, I, I see the pain, and I can't understand. So, the message, I suppose, is this, is you really don't know what's capable until you put it to the test. You don't know if that match is gonna make fire until you strike the match. Uh, you, and, and, and so you, you have to start with the belief system that there is value. So you have to start with a belief system that, number one, you know, there is a value in every circumstance in life, regardless of how bad it looks, and that, number two, you have control, and that you can figure this out. And it's like solving the puzzle. Like my mom said, is that it um, um, takes time, it takes pain, it's not easy. But the end result, you know, I mean, if you, if you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, if you, if you really can't imagine that, hey, things really are gonna get a whole lot better. And um, it's not quick, it's not a quick fix, but oh, by the way, uh, it is worth it. Um, put this for viewers first coming to this, a little bit in perspective, you went to the Naval Academy. You were the best of the best. <coughs> fair to say that four years at the Naval Academy, the central tenet of all of your training and then on in, in, in your training as a pilot was how to win, how to be the best, how to dominate, how to, like even the, the Naval Academy prayer is about you've got this, <coughs> you know, divine right almost to, to conquer, to win, to, to achieve. Let's just call it achievement. Um, some part of that ingredient did not prepare you to fail. When you failed, you were alone. That's the way these guys, these young people for PTSD are feeling. They're feeling alone. Mm -hmm. And the, the critical thing that happened gave you permission to fail. That was the beginning. If you can, talk to me about what that meant for you. Because your whole, and the other thing I want to kind of just tease here, for those prisoners who can't relate to Charlie Plum, you know, war hero, successful guy, you know, articulate everything else, there is an example of the guy who's not the fighter pilot, isn't it? And it's a Doug Hegel. Mm -hmm. There was among you, the lowest of the low, who gained all of your respect. There is in your ranks all manner and the full spectrum. So I just want to tie those two things okay. together. <clears throat> um, it is true that all of my military training was to win, and that was necessary. You don't, you don't fight a war with people that believe they're gonna lose. And so, I mean, er everything I did, the four years at the Naval Academy, the two years of learning to fly <clears throat> the uh, F-4 Phantom, it was all predicated on being the best of the best, being at the top uh, end, and we never practiced losing. You know, we, we, we never, we went through survival school, maybe that was a, a little bit of practicing losing, but we really never made an issue of the value of, <clears throat> of, um, of being less than you, that you really wanted to be. And so that was the big shocker. You know, that was, that, that was the, uh, the explosion in your mind that says, how can I be here? How can I be doing this? These folks are shooting at me. They can't do that. 
you know, they, they, and so, um, so, so I went through the transition. Now, um, how, uh, how do you learn to lose? Well, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's wise to practice losing. I think that the message here and the value of, 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 of an experience to that is knowing that a setback uh, can actually be of value to you. And, and, and yeah, we, most of us were fighter pilots, but you know, it wasn't just Doug Hegdo. We had a number of, uh, of enlisted guys in that prison camp, uh, crews from helicopters that tried to come in and rescue us. We had uh, some Vietnamese, some South Vietnamese in the prison. We had Thai uh, soldiers in that prison. And so, uh, uh, plus the fact that we had all ranks of people, you know, we had uh, Navy ensigns uh, in there. Uh, we had uh, Navy commanders uh, in there. So we, so we had the, kind of the full gamut. One of my cellmates uh, was actually a, um, uh, a, a part of the Hells Angels uh, motorcycle group before he became a, a Navy pilot. <laughs> and uh, and he, he lived life on the streets of uh, South Central LA, uh, basically stealing uh, cars and parts of cars. And he would tell me <laughs> that he and his crew could, that, they had a process where they could go into a neighborhood and steal the engine out of a car in 28 minutes, totally, totally um, take this, okay. This guy could, um, and, and his crew of uh, Hell's Angels could, uh, could actually go into a, a, a neighborhood, uh, open the hood of a car, take the engine out, put it in their pickup truck. 28 minutes it took them. You know, it, he said that you know, they'd close the hood and they'd wipe off all of their fingerprints and go away and somebody came up here, hey, uh, you know, my motor is missing. Yeah, it's really missing. <laughs> um, but but that, so that's how he grew up. Uh, I, would, I was a very poor kid when I, I grew up. I didn't have an indoor toilet until I was seven years old. And so, uh, and, and, and so we had the rich, we had the poor, uh, we had the high ranking, we had the low ranking. Of course, we had a, a, a number of enlisted guys. So it wasn't, suddenly we were all equal. You know, suddenly we were all in the same place at the same time trying to survive. And what I found as a very junior officer is that we had to connect with everybody else, everybody else. We had to respect everybody else. And of course, the Doug Hegdel story, which is, uh, which is a famous, famous story, the lowest ranking guy there, uh, and turned out to be you know, our favorite person. You know, one of the best leaders was a, a Navy a seaman. So, um, so I guess my point is this, it, it matters not <laughs> uh, where you're coming from. It matters not um, your background. It, 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 it matters not your rank or your age or your color or any of these things. So, so the point is this, it, it, it matters not, you, okay. So, so the point is, uh, it matters not. I, I was a very junior officer, 
uh, I, I was really not a very smart guy. You know, we, we had guys in there with photographic memories. And, and I, I, yeah, I went to the Naval Academy. By the way, I graduated in the half of the class that made the top half possible. <laughs> so I, 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 was, uh, I was outranked. Uh, and to, you know, to me, it really didn't make any difference if you were enlisted, if you're a uh, junior officer, senior officer, uh, black, white, uh, who, you know, it, it, those things, those things, um, they kind of fade away when you're all under the same stress, when, you, when, you, when you're all. So, so part, I think, of the reason we survived and even thrived in that situation is that we had community. The, and, and part of it was, was the fact that there's, um, you know, there, there's, there's comfort in the pain a bit. You know, when you're going through the same pain with everybody else, yeah, um, you can kind of understand and, and you can identify and you can communicate. And, and, and there was just a great, it, it gave us a lot of, of confidence, you know, confidence in ourselves and confidence in each other, confidence that we'd be out of there someday. So, so the, so I think that's vital as well. In um, in overcoming the adversity, you know, in uh, in in making lemonade out of lemons, is that you have to you have to have a support group. You, you have to you have to have people who either have gone through what you've been through or are going through what you you're going through. And uh, okay. <clears throat> It occurs to me if Stan went out and blocked the runway, you know, <laughs> take no, take his Varga out and roll it in the ditch or have a flat tire. Oh yeah, you should work on the VW out there. Hey, there you are. Try to figure out whether it's positive ground or negative. Ground. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe set it on fire. <laughs> if um, what you're saying is so key now, because these. When someone loses in a big way, their first instinct is to isolate themselves. They feel like nobody understands. And the one consistent thing in every single one of you that I have interviewed is none of you got past the point of defeat by yourself. You needed the others. Good point. That is, if we can get any message at all to them, mm -hmm. that the one moment of bravery, <coughs> the one moment of effort, they will not get out of that by themselves. It's only when another person reaches across and says, you're not alone. This I can relate to. Mm -hmm. If you can put that in your own words. And sure. Um. Back to the first guy I communicated with, Bob Shoemaker. I saw this as a wire coming through a hole at the base of my cell wall. I thought it was a, cric a cricket. It, it was the sound of a cricket. And, uh, but it was very rhythmic. It was like a snare drum, you know, and, and, and so I knew it wasn't a cricket. So I went over to the corner of the prison cell and I looked down, sure enough, there's a little wire poked through a hole in the cell wall. Now. My first thought was, the enemy is not sophisticated enough to, to, to do this. It's got to be an American. If it's an American, it's pretty sure it's a fighter pilot, like me. And boy, would I like to talk to another fighter pilot. Man, we can tell some stories. But then my next response was, I don't, I don't think I want to communicate with anybody. I was ashamed. And what you're going about to say is the most important thing of all, because everyone I've heard you, I don't think I want to talk. Yep. I'm too ashamed yep. to tell them who I am. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Let's wait. For next sure. <clears throat> you're right at the core. Of 
So I saw the wire coming through the hole in the wall, and I felt like it, it has to be an American, and it has to be a fighter pilot. And I would love to, to talk to a fighter pilot. That's what fighter pilots do, we talk. But oh, my... Kelly, I'm sorry. Okay. This is just too important to okay. uh, fight. Okay. All right. So when I saw the little wire coming through a hole at the base of the cell wall, my first thought was, uh, it can't be the enemy. They're not sophisticated enough to try to trick me. The second thought, uh huh, so it's got to be an American trying to communicate with me. And boy, do I need to talk to another American. But then my, the biggest thought, the biggest emotion I had at that time was, I don't want anybody to see me like this. I am so defeated, I, I, I didn't fulfill my mission. I am, I'm a terrible person. <laughs> I, I can't let anybody see me the way I am, especially another fighter pilot like me. I actually, uh, I actually sat back and thought about that for maybe an hour. Very busy place. This hour is really important because okay. you're going to be right in the center of where these kids are feeling when you're lying in these hospital beds. I failed. Everyone is better than you now. I'm alone and I'm ashamed. Mm -hmm. Even though they're not responsible for being hurt, they're ashamed because yeah. they're now cripples and mm -hmm. they're now less than what they wanted to be. So that hour, it wasn't 10 minutes, it wasn't two minutes. Wow, that's a long oh, yeah. hour. It was a long hour. <laughs> okay, so I saw, I saw the wire coming through the hole in the wall, and I'm saying to myself, it's got to be an American on the other end of that wire, and I'm all alone. Uh, I really need to communicate with another American. But the, but the bigger overriding emotion to me was shame. I, how, how can I ever expose myself to somebody that's better than I am, better pilot than I am, older than I am. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm bleeding from four open wounds, okay? How, I mean, how can I ever present that to anybody else? I'm so ashamed of who I am and what I've done and, uh, and, 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 and my, you know, my very position in life. Now, and, and that took an hour. I, I, I sweated bullets for an hour. In fact, the only reason that I, that I even communicated, the only reason I ever picked up that wire and tugged on a wire was because I was afraid that the noise of the wire was going to attract a guard. And I'm not sure I would have ever communicated with anybody else because that was my mindset. I was in this little prison of, of my mind that I can't, I can't, uh, I, I just, I, I, I can't, exp exp I can't let anybody know how badly I feel about myself. So um, that went on for at least an hour. I don't know how long it was, but it was a long time. And and Shoemaker didn't he didn't give up. <laughs> he he is a tenacious guy, and so he kept pulling on that wire, and it get you know the the, the noise it was creating. I was sure it was going to attract a guard. And so I, just to shut the thing up, you know, I finally tugged on the wire and it disappeared. And now, and now I really, you know, I really don't know what's going to happen now. And so I sweated bullets for another hour until the wire finally came back with the code on the wire. And I started communicating with him in the code. And we exchanged names and, and, and airplanes pilots do and then I finally I finally got up the guts to to say uh, Shu I, I I'm gonna conf I'm gonna give you a confession I'm, I'm gonna tell you what I did and when you hear what I did 
you might not want to communicate with me anymore. I, I understand that because if, if our roles were reversed, okay, if you had done what I did, and if you felt the shame that I feel because of what I, um, because of, of, of my failure, my defeat, I wouldn't want to talk to you either. So if our roles were reversed, I'd cut off our communication. He said, what'd you do, plumber? I said, I broke. I, I, I broke. Not only did I not accomplish my mission, but I failed when they tortured me. I wasn't as strong as I wanted to be. <laughs> Bob Shoemaker said, hell, none of us was as strong as we wanted to be. He said, we, 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 we've, all, we've all felt the defeat, he said. <laughs> but he said, pull up your big boy pants. He said, we still have a mission, we have a purpose. We have a war to fight, and we will pursue this war to our last dying breath. And he turned the whole thing around. He, he, said, he said, the leadership in this prison camp is the best you will ever see, bar none. He said, you've just joined a team of men better than any team you'll ever play on. We can't see each other. We can't talk to each other. We, uh, we really have no no control, our, our, our leaders can't give us a bonus, they can't promote us, they, uh, but they've turned the whole thing around. They've told us that we are not defeated and that we shouldn't feel miserable about our actions and that we are still uh, as good as we ever were and we are as strong as we ever were and we will he said, we're not going to positively think our way out of this thing. He said, because the reality is we're, um, you know, we're, we're under the gun. Uh, the reality is uh, this hurts. <laughs> the reality is um, it's going to take some time and some energy for us to do this. But the reality also is we still have control of our lives. And as long as that is true, then we will survive and even thrive through this experience. And let's put that in perspective <clears throat> for those who are beginning to get a glimmer of something here. There's two things I really <clears throat> want to get on camera is <clears throat> delivering the message clearly to the young um, servicemen or women who's lying in the seat. One is you will not get out. That ain't gonna happen. Yeah. Lying alone, shutting everyone up. It just isn't. Yeah. If you want out of it at all, you're gonna have to read it. Do you want me to reference specifically disabled veterans or well I'm just because this is an important part of the Yeah, I, I see your point. Yeah. And, and and I and I and I will and I will make that point. I think it's an important part <clears throat> of what the mission of this project is, is yeah. to get at least that voice in there. There's lots of other things I want to cover with sure. you. Sure that don't have to, anything to do with disabled veterans. Mm -hmm. In the defeat, I can see no greater impact and no greater place to put this that the military, uh, yep. for the military needs than yep. the working class. So just this component, I'm focusing on. Okay, give me that buzzword again as to... Um, you cannot get yeah. out of this. Yeah, a lot, yeah, okay, okay. No, you're not. No, you, no, you're right on. And that, you know, that's what I love about about this process is that that you see things that I believe, but uh, but I'm not articulating. And so, yeah, it, it works. It works. I mean, it's it's exactly what the author of the lessons from the Henley told me is if you went back and looked at all of your experiences and and you went through volumes of stories. So in watching the little wire bobbing in and out of that uh, that hole in my cell, um, and, and, and thinking to myself, 
I really don't want to communicate with anybody else. I feel miserable about, about who I am and what I've done. I, um, I feel very guilty. I feel very defeated. And I don't really want to share that with anyone else. And I sat for at least an hour just sweating bullets because the wire kept, uh, kept scratching on the floor. And, and, f and finally, I, I was afraid the guard was going to hear it and, and, and catch who was trying to communicate with me. And so I went over to the wire and I tugged on the wire. That moment changed my life because I didn't really want to do that. I didn't want to reach out to anyone else. And I am convinced that had I not, had I not made that move, had I not made that effort, had I not tugged on that wire, I probably would not have survived the prison camp. I probably would have died there. Um, and so, and so I, you know, I, I think it's true in life, is that sometimes in our de most defeated moments, when we are least apt to get further outside ourselves and communicate with anyone else and share our pain, that's the last thing in the world we want to do. And yet, it's the most important thing in the world we want to do um, is to is is to uh, communicate the the survival of the prisoners of war in, in Vietnam and the fact that we came back better off than had we not been shot down and captured. Uh, I think were two or three things. Um, the, obviously, the leadership, uh, the unity and community we put together, but we couldn't have done none of that had we not reached out to touch other people. It would not have happened had we not established this very elaborate communication system. Um, you know, the same in life. We, we bottle ourselves up when we feel um, defeated, when we feel embarrassed, when we don't want anyone else to see us in the situation that we're in. And in doing so, in bottling ourselves up like that, uh, we, we actually uh, achieve defeat, um, not because of any external problems, it's the, our choices we make and our inability to get out and reach out and make a connection. side of the spectrum, which is, you talk about being a, uh, a Gen Z, junior very <coughs> So you got to watch uh, the development of leadership from all levels, your own inspired followership as well as, you know, and of course at the top of that, <clears throat> One of the things that the military student who would be viewing this footage is looking for is how to be a better leader. What are the ingredients of leadership? We now know <coughs> it is absolutely important to understand the people who are following you and what they're going through emotionally, what they're facing, what they might be feeling you're going to help them. Because one of the first things in that room with, with uh, when Bob was sitting in the room with, uh, uh, who was it, Terry, that guy, the fat coat in Korea? Uh, Smitty Harris. Smitty Harris, yeah. He said, we need a way to communicate. That was the beginning of this. Mm -hmm. By the time you got there, something was already in place. Oh, yeah. So that was recognizing one aspect of, of leadership. The other one is now, given what you just described, Bob understood something. He was persisting for a reason. He had been there, was there, and he wasn't gonna let you off the hook. So let's talk about now the first aspect of leadership, what you witnessed, <coughs> see if we can deconstruct it a little bit so that we see themes. Okay.
Bob Shoemaker, in passing that wire through the, across the storeroom and uh, into the hole in my wall, was the first evidence of the leadership in the prison camp. As well, it's the first communication I had with anybody uh, in, in the prison camp. <clears throat> so, and I was really reluctant at first. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, I've seen leadership like this before. You know, the brass gets together and they've got this power play and, uh, and so they make up all these rules and uh, expect the junior officers to follow all these rules. And I was a little reticent to even uh, communicate. Sure. <clears throat> Jack, can you do something about them out there? Can you just wave a flag or something? <laughs> I'm counting on you, Sam. <laughs> 60 gallons worth per minute. <laughs> yeah, it would. <clears throat> So my, the first evidence of leadership, of course, was the first guy I communicated with, Bob Shoemaker. He'd been there for two years when I showed up. And so he, he knew a, a, a lot of the techniques and the specifics that we were going to use. Now, I'm not sure if he really put this together in his mind, the, the principles of leadership, or it just came natural to him that he had to communicate with a new prisoner. And, but we all picked up on that. And we went to great lengths to communicate because in every case that I know of, and, 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 and I did this a lot, you know, when a, a new guy would come in and be in the cell next to mine or I'd see him out a crack in the door uh, and I'd pass the word around, we have to get this guy on board. And it was job one for all of us to communicate with the other guys because we knew that if they were put off in the corner of the prison camp and could not or would not communicate because they felt guilty before they felt defeated, they didn't want to, to and, 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 and most everybody did. Most everybody was reluctant to communicate at first. And so we went to great lengths and Shoemaker had pieced together those little bits of wire over the two years that he'd been in that cell and passed them across this storeroom to me uh, just to bring me into the fold, just to bring me into the support group because, because he knew, he already knew, I think, something I didn't know, that if I didn't communicate with the other guys, I probably wasn't going to survive the prison situation. Uh, so it was life or death that we communicate with each other. The important part of that was that the life-death value of communication was not the data that we were passing around. It wasn't the, the words or the message or even The, the important part of the communication wasn't the data, uh, the words, the sentences, the phrases. The, the value, the life-saving value in a prison camp of communication, and I think in normal life, <laughs> is the simple validation of another human being. Because in, in those prison cells, especially if it was dark, and it was in a lot of the camps. The, ones, the, the camps in the mountains were, you, you couldn't tell green from red. Uh, and, and if you were alone, if you were in solitary confinement and it was dark, you'd lose track. Your mind would, would kind of go crazy. Uh, you, 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 you wouldn't know 
in a moment if you were alive or dead. There, there, there was nothing to prove to me that I was actually, I could pinch myself, you know, but I didn't know if I was alive or dead. The simple tugging on that wire and to have that wire tug back. I mean, two things. Number one, somebody's responding to something I'm doing physically. Okay, thus I exist. Number two, somebody cares. And that's what you get when you reach out and touch another life. You care enough, they care enough, and you communicate. And that was the baseline, I think, of survival in the prison camp was the fact that we cared about each other. Didn't make any difference, you know, ranks, color, uh, age. Uh, didn't make any difference. We, we, we cared about each other. And that was, that was vital. Yep, yep. And he also said, you matter to him. Mm -hmm. That's what stopped it, maybe. Mm -hmm. he tapped, and he didn't think Charlie Palmer's seven cells down. He just tapped through the wall. Yeah. And that went down, and it meant the same to you as it meant to the guy who tapped it to you, and meant to the guy you tapped it to. So, um, as you describe this, can also frame it for these young emerging leaders who are asking the question, what okay. do I you know, how do how do I lead? Or what are the important things to understand? Okay. <clears throat> so the f the first leader that I met in the prison camp, Bob Shoemaker, had been there for two years and had passed that wire through the hole in the wall. He this guy this guy had undergone hardship, brutality, the threat of torture had he been caught, and it was that important for him to communicate with me. And so I see that as principle number one of leadership. You really have to care. You have to care enough about your followership. You, you, know, you have to believe that there's value in the experience. And Shoemaker didn't have to do that. You know, he, he didn't have to go through that. And, and then, of course, we all picked up on, on this technique, you know, the, 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 the importance of communication and bringing new guys into the community. And so we, uh, you know, that was always a very high value. And, and so all of us then underwent hardship, brutality, even the threat of torture to communicate with other guys. Um, John McCain uh, was a pretty good example of this. Uh, he was in a cell down the, the, the cell block from mine in the camp called, we, can't, we call the plantation. He was right across from um, the, um, the sewer house. The sewer house was a brick building, as you might suspect. Uh, and in the middle of the brick, it's small. You know, the thing was only eight or 10 feet by eight or 10 feet. In the middle of the sewer house was a hole, and that's where you dumped your bucket. You know, every, every three or four days, you got to take your two-gallon bucket out and dump it in the sewer. Well, the, the bad news about the sewer house was it stunk to high heaven. I mean, you could not, you absolutely could not take a breath inside the sewer house. It was as filthy, it, it, you know, rats and bugs and flies and all the stuff in the sewer house. That's the bad news. The good news was, um, the guards didn't like the sewer house either. They didn't go in there with you when you went to, to, to dump your bucket. And so we set up a communication system in the sewer house. We designated various cracks in the bricks uh, inside that sewer house to be P.O. boxes, okay? So each one would, rep would, would, would represent one of the cells. 
And so you would take your little notes written on pieces of toilet paper and ink made from ashes or brick dust. And you'd put it in your little belt loop and you'd carry your, of course the guards are, you know, two steps behind us all the way. You'd carry your, your little, um, your, your, your little bucket. Uh, and sometimes you didn't have handles, you were carrying them like this into the sewer house and you'd dump your bucket and put your mail into the person you're sending it to and pick up your mail and, 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 and on your way. It was a thing of beauty <laughs> until one day one of my buddies is going down the sewer house and as he makes his turn into the sewer house the, the note falls out of his belt loop. It's on the ground. Now this is serious stuff because if they find out, not only they're going to destroy the communication system that we had set up, but we, um, uh, but somebody's going to get hurt. In fact, a lot of people are going to get hurt when they start reading all these notes. John McCain was his cell faced the sewer house. He was he, and he was standing there on his homemade crutches and peeking through a crack in in his door at the sewer house and watching. POWs come in and <laughs> dump their buckets. When he saw the, the instant he saw that note fall out, he started banging on his door, cussing at the top of his lungs. The, the guard went over and beat up John McCain while my buddy picked up his note and went on into the sewer house and, <laughs> and, 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 and it went out his way. And, and everything was hunky dory just because of that. And the reason I'm even telling you that story is that everybody there knew the value of that communication. I mean, it was priority one to communicate with everybody. And we had all kinds of, of fun ways to communicate. One of them was if anybody got out to chop wood for the fire, he would chop in the tap code, you know. Uh, the tap code, uh, it, it, you know, two numbers would represent a letter. And so he would go chop, 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 chop. It was a radio station. <laughs> Everybody in the camp could hear th this guy chopping wood, and the enemy paid no attention. The guys out there chopping wood didn't figure out that this was actually being spread throughout the camp. So uh, reaching out and communication and, uh, and uh, tapping into the other lives uh, was not just a good idea. It was life or death, and it worked. That is amazing. You're, you're Do I have stories or what? <laughs> I've never heard You've not heard the McCain story? And I, even though I knew about the notes being dropped, I never really realized you had a whole PO box system inside there. Each cell had its own little crack, and that's just fantastic. <laughs> what a film. McCain <laughs> anticipating what was about to happen and causing the diversion. Yeah. It's astonishing. Um, yeah. Can we take a break for a second? Yeah. Uh, sure. Let's. Uh, we're gonna take a little. You want to take a little? Uh, yeah. Let me grab some more coffee. Yeah. Hold on. Let me uh, cut that down. Okay. <laughs>